Class of 2024. Hello everyone, student chair, and please, class of 2026, take the time now to read the honor code and sign it. Once you have, please pass your code towards the center aisles so the honor code members can recollect it. While you do, I would like to take some time to talk to you about the honor code as a vital and prominent part of Hamilton's academic culture and goals. One of these people who was walking around collecting them. Okay, let's see a few still out there. It is now my pleasure to introduce the 20th president of Hamilton College, David Whitman. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. A special welcome to the class of 2026. Today marks the start of your first year at Hamilton. It also marks the start of the college's 211th year. So unlike the crew of the Enterprise, you are boldly going where, frankly, a lot of people have gone before. But that's okay, everyone's path is different. And while your four-year mission may not be to explore strange new worlds and seek out new civilizations, it will be to prepare for lives of meaning purpose, and active citizenship. And that does mean exploring new ideas and seeking out new people. After hearing some of your orientation stories, I'm convinced you're off to a great start. This year we fielded 60 trips with 120 trip leaders, every bus, van, and car we could find, and enough trail mix to fill the Route Glen. These trips are always an opportunity to bond, to learn, sometimes to engage in service. One canoeing group came across a family whose boat was taking on water and starting to sink and staged an impromptu rescue. They paddled over, threw them a line, towed them to shore, while the father, son, and family dog swam alongside. There was another group where the trip leaders decided they would provide some lessons on environment and sustainability. So they engaged their trip members on an extensive discussion of the problems of invasive species, and in particular, the problems of the dreaded invasive watermelon. Sure enough, the students soon encountered a watermelon on their path. They took care to take it apart and put the seeds in bags so that they wouldn't spread. Of course, the watermelons were purchased at Hannaford's, and they were placed on the trail by the trip leaders. I'd like to think they were really trying to drive home two important lessons. One, at Hamilton, we want you to be open to new ideas, something I'll say more about in a moment. 
but we also want you to look for evidence before you adopt those ideas as your own. And if you're on that trip and still wondering, there is no such thing as an invasive watermelon. Every year as I watch 500 students and 120 trip leaders head off to go kayaking, canoeing, hiking, climbing, biking, engaging community service, and explorations of various kinds, many in remote areas with little or no cell phone service, which unfortunately does little to distinguish those areas from my house, I always wonder what could possibly go wrong. Actually, I don't really think that anymore because now we know what could go wrong. Bears, bugs, rain, capsized canoes, heat, humidity, axes swung in a way that axes should not be swung, vans running into inconveniently placed trees, and last year, a few intrepid students who managed to navigate their canoe over a 20-foot waterfall. Well, who says Gen Z isn't resilient? A lot of people, actually, but then your generation has not had an easy path. You were born just in time for the Great Recession. You came of age in a world of political polarization, school shootings, climate change, racial injustice, armed conflict, and the worst pandemic in 100 years, and you got to watch all of it play out in real time on your smartphones. According to the Pew Foundation, yours is the most diverse generation in American history, and it is on track to become the best educated, which gives me hope. Climate change, social justice, and economic security are major concerns for Gen Z. Yours is a generation of digital natives with no memory of a world without smartphones, or for that matter, a world in which Vladimir Putin was not the leader of Russia. In high school, according to social psychologist Jean Twenge, your generation was less likely to leave the house without their parents, to date, to engage in sexual activity, to hold a driver's license, to drink alcohol, to socialize in person, or to engage in the responsibilities and pleasures of adulthood than were your counterparts a few decades ago. Yours is also a generation facing an unprecedented mental health challenge. According to a recent NBC poll, two-thirds of your generation reported suffering last year from anxiety and half from depression. And yet, despite all of that, your generation is remarkably optimistic about the future with 86% saying they were either super op optimistic or pretty optimistic. One might chalk that up, as Samuel Johnson said about second marriages, to a triumph of hope over experience. But I think it is a testament to your underlying resilience. College is an opportunity for a fresh start, to think about cultivating existing interests and develop new ones, to learn to think freely and critically to learn from difference, and to build the habits of mind that will serve you well on whatever path you take after graduation. To take full advantage of what college offers requires an openness to ideas and perspectives that differ from your own, even if they are not about watermelons. Many of us live in information bubbles. We talk only to those who think as we do, read selectively, look at websites that curate information to conform to pre-existing beliefs, and dismiss evidence that is inconsistent with our assumptions. Worse, we tend to shun those who think differently. I want to say that that is an illiberal response, not in the political sense, but in the academic sense. Hamilton's educational goals, as adopted by the faculty, spell this out. We ask you to examine facts, phenomena, and issues in depth and from a variety of perspectives. And we want you to have the courage to revise beliefs and outlooks in the light of new evidence. You can't do that if you don't engage with views and perspectives which differ from yours. This sounds easy, but it isn't. And some people may try to prevent you from hearing a full range of views. Conservative activists have for years monitored college classrooms, looking for and publicizing instances of perceived liberal bias, periodically triggering what has been called the right-wing outrage machine. And more recently, legislators in many states have introduced legislation to restrict the teaching of critical race theory, issues of gender identity, and what are vaguely termed divisive concepts. On the other side, efforts to constrain unfettered campus discourse take a different form. Sometimes, though far less common than, is many, than many think, 
It involves disinviting or shouting down speakers, something not tolerated here. Sometimes it involves suppressing unpopular viewpoints through ostracization or social media mobbing. As a result, students often self-censor on hot-button social issues. According to one recent survey, 31% of campus Democrats and 48% of campus Republicans are reluctant to speak their minds for fear they will be judged harshly by their peers. Ironically, students by large majorities report that they want to hear a wide range of viewpoints. I hope you will encourage that and support it. Part of your education here lies precisely in exploring new ideas and new ways of thinking, and in getting to know people with different identities, backgrounds, and interests. Doing so will not be without friction, it will not always be easy, and it won't always be comfortable. But easy and comfortable are not part of our mission. Intellectual, social, and moral development are, and they occur best when we confront new ideas and consider other perspectives. You have four wonderful years ahead. I encourage you to make the most of them. Welcome to Hamilton College. I'd like now to invite our Dean of Faculty, Nagoni Munemo, to join me at the podium and to ask Jorge to bring up the signed honor codes. We have of the class of 2026, I present to Professor, uh, to President Whitman, the signed copies of the honor codes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jorge. Uh, on behalf of my Hamilton faculty colleagues, uh, whom I represent uh, in this ceremony, I'm pleased to accept these signed uh, honor cards uh, from you. Why such pomp and ritual? Many of our peer schools, if they still have honor codes, now ask students to simply e-sign them. Uh, I can think of two reasons. One, I think we needed to fabricate an occasion to wear these clumsy polyester robes. Um, second, um, and more seriously, I believe we are right to hold on to the theater and ceremony of the signing and presentation because your declaration that by your honor you will abstain from academic honesty, from dishonesty in academic work, stands as a cornerstone of the community of learning we hold so dear here at Hamilton. This pledge is therefore rightly made publicly to your faculty in front of your peers because together we shall support each other, learn from each other, and if need be, hold each other accountable for the standards we expect each of us to live by while we're on the Hill. And by your participation in this right, and on behalf of the faculty, I'm honored to welcome you into the community of trust, responsibility, and academic integrity, which will be the hallmark of your time at Hamilton. I trust, though, that you recognize that the promise you have made by signing these pieces of paper and handing them over to us is, in effect, a pledge to complete honesty and ongoing tasks you will repeat many, many times over over the next four years. That is, each day for the next four years, your faculty and your peers will expect you to live up to and reaffirm your integrity in your academic work and actions. I'm hopeful that by each of, these, each of those actions, you will make real the cherished values of honesty, trust, inclusiveness, courage, mindfulness, and forbearance around which any community of learning is built. You enter into your Hamilton College education so that you may know life, know yourself. But what does that mean? I think it means that here you can be who you want to be and begin to build your future selves. 
I trust that along this path of self-discovery and self-making, you will find time to go to a recital, a lecture, a reading, an art show, a theater performance, STEM poster sessions, or visit the Welland Museum. I hope you engage in experiential education, attend a game or intramural meet, or find a comfortable spot somewhere on the campus to get lost in a book. Each of these things done in pursuit of knowing yourself is time well spent. You may not know that I too am a new member of this community. As such, I've been thinking about the second half of our mission, the half that does not quite fit so neatly onto banners, the half we only ever seem to whisper, perhaps because we're a little unsure of it, or perhaps because it's part of the mission that feels a bit tenuous and in need of protection. That is, that at Hamilton, we don't ask you to seek to know yourself for selfish reasons, but to know yourself in order to address the world's most pressing problem. For only after gaining a full appreciation of your strengths, skills, and interests can you make a valuable contribution to society. How does one achieve this lofty goal? I think there's only one way, by finding each other. I urge you to build community and a sense of common purpose. As the Martinician theorist Franz Omer von Vanon wrote in his most famous work, The Wretched of the Earth, every generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. Fanon addressed these words to the rising generation of anti-colonial and decolonial activists across Africa and the rest of the still colonized world, but I argue they pertain to you today just as much as they did to the young people coming of age in the 1960s. And how else can you discover your generation's mission to either fulfill it or betray it without each other? So seek each other, know one another, to learn to know yourself. Perhaps you think it's quite, it's odd to quote Fanon in remarks about academic integrity. But think of this, it is the very habits of citing, of referencing, and of building on the work of scholars and artists who have come before you that will inform and clarify the discovery of your generational mission. That will build purpose in the lives you will go on to lead. To Fanon again, we must rid ourselves of the habit of minimizing the action of those who come before us, of feigning incomprehension when considering their silence or passivity. They fought as well as they could with the arms that they possessed then, and if the echoes of their struggle have not resounded in the international arena, we must realize that the reason for this silence lies less in their lack of heroism than in the fundamentally different international situation of our time. The scholars and artists and activists, organizers and revolutionaries you will engage in your academic papers and classroom discussions today and for the next four years bear the shoulders upon which you will stand. Pay them homage, pay them heed, and then grow beyond them. In accepting these cards from you today, I welcome you into this cherished community of scholarship and exchange of ideas. Here, I hope we shall care for each other, respectfully question each other, and learn from each other, all the while holding on, holding one another to the highest standards of mutual trust. Welcome to Hamilton. On behalf of President Whitman, I invite Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, Chris Card, to the podium. Thank you, Dean Mabel. Hello and welcome. As you heard, I'm Christopher Card, Vice President for Student Affairs and the Dean of Students 
And it's a distinct honor for me to be present to welcome our entering class transfer students, returning students, all of you here to the Hamilton community, or as I've been instructed, to the Hamily. Welcome to this dynamic place filled with students, staff, and faculty who combine our passions and energy to make a difference in this world. You join a community of scholars who are ready to engage you, befriend you, teach you, and importantly as well, to learn from you. And so again, hello and welcome. These two seemingly simple words will be more important than you may realize now as you settle into this community, into this place where we live and where we learn together. And you will hear them often. Saying hello is more than a simple greeting. On one hand, it's an acknowledgement of the other person. On the other, it's that intentional act of inviting another person into your life and into your presence. Do not underestimate the power and the influence of saying hello. Doing so is important for our collective sense of community and for the individual sense of belonging. I know you'll be welcome time and time again. You probably have already, especially over the next few days. I have been amazed at how welcoming and supportive this community has been since my arrival at Hamilton just 10 short days ago. I know that you will feel a sense of welcome here, and I hope it will be sustained throughout your time at Hamilton. We are a community that hopes to welcome the whole person, not just the personal characteristics that you think we ought to know. So here is an invitation to bring your whole selves to the conversations, discussions, and relationships that will emerge over your time here. And as you are welcome to this experience that is Hamilton, be sure to extend your own welcome to others as well. Welcome people and ideas that are different and challenging. Welcome respectful disagreement and civil discourse. Welcome those who may be curious about who you are, what you believe, and why you believe it. And just as we welcome you, and we welcome you fully, be sure to welcome the whole person as well. The whole person all their identities, all their flaws, all their graces. Communities like ours are at their best when we, when we engage each other. Thank you. It's my pleasure to invite Professor Penny Lee, Associate Dean of the Faculty, to acknowledge our prize recipients. As part of our convocation tradition, to award a number of scholarships and prize them to stand. The awards will be announced by category as they appear in your program. If you're the winner of an award, please stand and remain standing until the next award is announced. I ask that everyone please hold their applause until the end of each group. I'll begin by recognizing the recipients of the prize scholarships. The Benjamin Walworth Arnold Prize Scholarship. Olivia Kyoda, Chloe Kyoda, Brendan McGill, and Deanna Durbin. <laughs> the Robert A. Banker Jr. Prize Scholarship, Frank Valoy. The <laughs> so I'll read the prizes, and then we're done with all the prize scholarships. Then we can get through this faster. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, the Charles A. Dana Prize Scholarships to Michaela Alston and Laura Barrera. <laughs> also, Maria Cristina Ferreira Crespo, Andrew Fredericks, Grisha Godovitz, William No, Shana Polsky, Claire Williams. The Donald A. Hamilton Prize Scholarship goes to Eric Moss. 
the Ann Miller Hardin Prize Scholarship, Danielle Bernstein, the Matthew Houlihan Prize Scholarship, Sarah Sanderson, the Edward Huntington Memorial Math Mathematical Prize Scholarship, Trevor Schuing, the Grant 21 and Silas 52 Keene Prize Scholarships, Degrisha Godovets and Shana Polsky. The Willard Bostwick Marsh Prize Scholarships, Chloe Kyoda, Olivia Kyoda, and Brendan McGill. The Marcel Maraud Memorial Prize Scholarship, Dr. Sophie Christensen. The Oren Root Jr. Prize Scholarships, Grace Brophy, Catherine Grismore, and Jonathan Wilson. The Arthur W. Soper Prize Scholarship in Latin, Jonathan Setzer. The Chauncey S. Truex Scholarship in Greek goes to Aidan Holmgren. The Vrooman Prize Scholarship goes to Angela Escalante Zarco. The Lawrence Yorty Prize Scholarship, Slade Springer. Let's congratulate our prize scholarship winners. Now we'll recognize the winners of achievement prizes. The Brockway Prize, Deanna Durbin. The Class of 1990 Scholarship, Grisha Gorovets. The CRC Press First Year Prize in Chemistry, Dasomi Kim, Ryan Rahman, and Ian Vogelsang. The Dr. Edward Fitch Prize in Latin, Frank Cheng. The Dr. Edward Fitch Prize in Greek, Helen Higgins. The Leo Macta Prize in Physics, Claire Nelly. The Phi Beta Kappa Book Prizes, Maya Chaikin, Frank Cheng, Rebecca Dolphin, Shradadata, Diana Durbin, Claire Williams, Chen Yua Yang, Yi Yang Zhang. The Rusty Smith Memorial Teaching Prize in Computer Science, Joshua Harmson. The Linda Aqua Strobel Memorial Teaching Prize in Mathematics, Wildo Gutierrez. Gabriela Rosario Guerrero. The Winslow Prize in Greek, Tate Bergen. The Winslow Prize in Latin, Alexandra Ennis. The Winslow Prize in Romance Languages, French, Salwa Sadahmed. The Winslow Prize in Romance Languages, Hispanic Studies, Sophia Sherman. Please congratulate our Achievement Prize winners. <laughs> now let us acknowledge our Writing Prize recipients. The Hutton Essay Prize, Elizabeth Sider. The Dwight N. Lindley Prize, Rachel Budd. The Alfred J. and A. Barrett Seaman Prizes in Writing, Claire Nelly, Brian Sider, Anna O'Shea, Julian Swope, and Gabriela de Mendoza Gomez. Please congratulate our Writing Prize winners.
Join me in congratulating all of this year's award recipients. Please rise if you are able. We will conclude this ceremony by listening to the college choir sing Carissima. Please remain in place until after the procession has left the auditorium. Everyone is invited to the convocation picnic on the Dunham Green. This marks the end of this occasion and the beginning of Hamilton College's 211th year. This assembly is adjourned.